Mandela, as I said, spoke from the standpoint of a new triumphalism that came into South African politics as apartheid was being torn down and eliminated. We know that apartheid has not been properly eliminated in South Africa. We know that black people have been sucked up by a suction effect that makes very many, many, many of the new black elite believe that freedom has come for the whole people simply because they can ride their jeeps, live in, live in, 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 in new mansions and the rest of it. The majority of South Africans are not in that, in, 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 are not in, that, in the same camp. There is, there is a clear sign of how they are not in it by the fact that the failure rate or the dropout rate in schools in South Africa is up to 60% in many cases. And when you look at why, you will understand what I mean when I say the triumphalism with which they set out, it was good. It was good from the standpoint of people who have just become independent. I mean, Nigeria also became independent and we are talking about being the greatest country in Africa the, 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 and the rest of it. But as I, as I once told a, a, a student population that invited me to speak in Durban, they were happy to see a film that put down Nigeria. And I told them that that is where they are going in the manner in which their society was being structured and run. Mandela was good for liberation. But let us define liberation not only in terms of taking, taking the white man out of power, but ensuring that whether we are living with black, white, yellow, or green human beings, we adopt an economic system that provides justice, that allows the people as a majority, as a community, to acquire the knowledge that saves lives. And the point that needs to be made here is this. What Mandela thought of Nigeria was based on the sassy reporting of international, international politics and journalism, which made Nigeria look like the epitome of the corrupt state without considering that in every poor society where the majority are ground down in poverty and have no access to the means of proper livelihood, all the symptoms, all the things he said about Nigeria occur. And in South Africa, they, are, they have occurred at such a fast rate that anybody who pretends that Nigeria is more corrupt than South Africa today has never looked at both societies. Mm. They have exactly the same forms of corruption and the same forms of abandonment of the poor majority. Mm. If you are thinking of any change at all, if you are thinking of any change at all, you therefore need to revise all those things Mandela said about Nigeria. They are things that are applicable to the South African society of today. Because of the first world infrastructure that have been built in South Africa by what I call African socialism, it is possible to talk about a basis that makes South Africa look different. Nigeria used to be of that state. South Africa may just be talking about a first world infrastructure but a political life and a social existence that is not in any way different from all the corrupt African states that we are talking about. We need to redefine our terms. And it is important for us to emphasize this point, that South Africa is actually being saved by globalization in the sense that they can take from several African countries and acquire some semblance of, uh, of a of uh, stability, economic stability for their structural adjustment programs. They are not seeing that many of the African societies that they therefore do business with are being impoverished in a way that will eventually bounce back on South Africa. Because as those countries are being impoverished and being denatured and moved in the wrong directions, troubles will start in those countries. And those troubles will put South African investment in all those places in trouble. 
rather than work out a collective arrangement with very many of these countries. What South Africa is doing on the basis of its triumphalism is to create a bounce back culture that they won't be able to deal with because within South Africa itself, they have already adopted a policy that is self-destruct, that we self-destruct. And the new elite in South Africa is more brainless than the one in Nigeria. And when I say that, I am not being sassy or being patriotic or nationalistic. I say they are more brainless because the amount of educated people Nigeria had created and driven into the diaspora is so vast that today South Africa runs well because there are some universities in South Africa where 60% of the teaching staff are from Nigeria. If Nigeria was a serious country and, had, and can bring back just half of the population of the educated people we drove away, we will have a wonderful economy that can industrialize and face the rest of the world without fear. But what we have been reduced to and what the South African triumphalism does not perceive is a country that has accepted its own self-destruction by creating a self-forgetting form which allows the leaders to pretend that they could be excellent even if their country is not so excellent. Mm. I am too much of an Awolo woman not to see that the process of moving to independence in South Africa and in Nigeria followed exactly the same pattern. It was based on a negotiated settlement. The liberation struggle did not create the, the, did not create, uh, the end of apartheid. It was a negotiation. And Nigerians negotiated exactly in the way that Mandela negotiated. All that, all, you can hype it if you like. The pattern was exactly the same. You move from one meeting to the other, discussing politics and economics. And they successfully convinced, they successfully convinced Mandela to buy the pig in the poke of an economy as they successfully succeeded in con 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 convincing Nigerians to buy the pig in the poke of an economy. The only man in Nigeria who stood up against it was Awodawo. He was quickly jailed. All his men scattered in various prisons across Nigeria, some driven abroad. And the, and the educational system that he had put in place was smashed. All that talk about free education, free health, uh, full employment, and uh, old age pensions. We are removed from the contention of very many Nigerians. I wonder was lucky that they had a large ethnic group which had benefited enough from his own policies never to forget, forget him. So that when he returned from jail, he could still continue saying the same things without fear. And he had educated that region enough to the point where their leadership position intellectually across the country was turned into a central definer of where Nigeria was and where Nigeria was likely to go. So, so are, you, are you comparing Awulawo with Mandela? Precisely what I am doing. Mm. When they were negotiating in South Africa, the, the South African friends I had in London, I was living in Oxford then, I told them they should go to the old western region in Nigeria and find out what happened and how it was destroyed. Because they needed to know what happened in Nigeria in order not to follow the same path. What Awolowo did for the Western region was what every African country needed to do. Awolowo believed not in a tyrannical undemocratic system, but a proper democracy. And he believed in a democracy based on a federal ethic. He did not agree with Nkrumah that you needed a one-party state in order to run a modern African society. And he believed in the industrialization and free education in the way Nkrumah believed in it. Nkrumah was forced by imperialist pressure to go tyrannical. Don't ever let us forget it. But Awolowo was not of that kind. Awolowo is the only African leader in government who lost an election. 1954 election, federal, the federal election of 1954. He lost it to the action group because, I mean, he lost it to the NCNC because he insisted that before the, state, the region could start free education and free health services, Every taxpaying adult must pay a levy of 10 shillings. I mean, a levy of 10 shillings was what was required 
to make it completely free forever. And the only reason you needed that tension is well because he had calculated that after a number of years of pursuing free education, there will be nothing in the budget to sustain it. So he needed a buffer for that little gap when the money would come down. Because cocoa prices were fluctuating in the world market and he knew that that point would come when he would need money. So he needed it. All, this, all the people who refused to pay the levy, he sent tax collectors into all the rural areas of the western region to force them to pay. It was then free and compulsory education. Many people refused to pay and he forced them to pay. And he told them, we can be forced to be free. If you do not like me for it today, your children will love me for it. Let us look at ourselves today. Aren't we all praising our Lord? Even his enemies have all now come to his side. In fact, they have so turned themselves to his side that from 1979, the constitutions of Nigeria adopted our Lord's program in economics and in politics as the only basis for running Nigeria. Many people pretend not to know that the 79 constitution was an Awolowo constitution and that the only thing wrong with that constitution was the refusal to accept the things Awolowo demanded. And one of those things was that education should be justiciable, which is to say a child who is denied education can go to court and insist on being given education. If Awolowo's program was good yesterday, I insist it is still good today. And I believe that if South Africans needed to move away from where they are obviously going, they would need to go back to our level. It is not just socialism. It is investment. If you put money in social welfare, you are investing. Anybody who tells you that there is a conflictual relationship between investment and welfare has never studied history. When people talk about Mandela's capacity to bring various classes together. As theory, Awolowo ironed it out very, very clearly. Why you don't need a class struggle in order to create a society in which all children can go to school, in which everybody can get a job, and in which old age pensions will be paid to people. It is not just love, and I want to emphasize that. It is not just love. Those who criticize Awolowo socially for wanting love are obviously basing their arguments on his claim that a government should be like the sun that shines on all equally. If it is about a theory of how to bring a people together, if on the African continent, none is as good as Awola was. And I am not trying to pretend, bring all their writings, fine phrases all right, but reduce them to economic terms. And I can tell you, there's only one man who rivals Awolowo in this respect, Nkrumah. Unfortunately, unlike Awolowo, Nkrumah did not believe in either a democratic or a federal theory. If you want to save Africa, you need those two. Hmm. You actually rated Awolowo so much that uh, you, if they give you a Mandela and an Awolowo, you pick Awolowo first. Yes. And I will tell you the simple reason. The simple reason is that what needed to be done in South Africa after apartheid was precisely what Awolowo wanted for the Western region and wanted for Nigeria after independence, which is to say, put every child at school, ensure that productivity takes the creativity of the individual citizen into proper focus and build the relationship between people not on whether they loved or did not love each other, but whether there is justice, whether there is equality. I would always used to brag that workers could not go on strike in the Western region while he was there before, because, because before they thought about it, he would have done it. He, 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 gave, he raised minimum wage from one and nine pence to five shillings when many people thought it was silly to do so. The Western region survived it. But people have forgotten that the only reason the Daily Times was able to sell 600,000 copies of, of their paper every day was because from the day people got their minimum wage of five shillings, more and more people could buy newspapers. Even those who could not read would buy the, the Daily Times and put it on their armpit and take it home for people to read for them. You created a society 
of enlightening people by ensuring that the redivision was every, in major in all the, in major cities was everywhere. He created a television system, a mobile free cinema system to go into the villages where you could not build proper cinema houses. No, we had a system that not only worked, but promised a future that was better than the one that the Western world was, was, was promising their own people. But I was only in the Western region. That is exactly you know. the point I make, that a very deliberate effort was made to ensure that Awolowo or somebody like Awolowo will not become head of an African country. And when they discovered that Nkrumah was such a person, they hacked him down. But you read Chinua Achebe also accusing Awolo of committing genocide against the Bo community. If he became the president fact, of Nigeria... In fact, I am happy. I am happy you have mentioned it. Where Chinua Achebe should have started his story is just at the level of basic theory. All the Igbo people in the Western region enjoyed free education and enjoyed the five shillings minimum wage. They who rejected free education and voted against it because they voted against our law. They who rejected the minimum wage by voting against our law and voting against, therefore, the minimum wage, who would not accept full employment for that reason, we are the actual creators of the basis for genocide because what they did was to create a system which said, don't forget it, it began by saying that after the colonialists we have been driven away, the Northerners who will take over the government do not have enough educated people to fill the job that the, that the Oibo man will be leaving. So the, the NCNC representing the East organized for the jobs to be taken over. They took over all the jobs and ensured that people from other regions were eliminated from strategic positions. Don't let us ever forget it. Chino Achebe himself became a director of external broadcasting as a young man fresh from the university. They took over as many jobs as could be taken over. But you see, they did not count on something. While they were taking over all the jobs, the Northerners whom they thought were silly and did not know what to do, made sure that all the railway extensions in Nigeria, all the military installations, the Kanji Dam for, for electricity, and even the, the iron and steel industry, which was already proposed to be sited in the east, all of them went to the north. It was at that point in 1964 that the Easterners realized that the northern ruling class was not as bankrupt, ignorant, or unthinking as they had imagined. Mm. It but was if, at if... that point that the idea of a coup began in Nigeria's history. Because that year, when, when the NPC, NNA, the NNA, uh, the NPC and NDP coalition, NNA, won the election, Zeke refused to call them to form a government because, as he said, they had rigged the election. They knew that if Anawarawa was the president of Nigeria, Singapore would be just small stuff in relation to the kind of achievements we would have had. We had television, we had television in, in, in the Western region before many Europeans heard about it. We had free, a free education system in the Western region because most people, before most people in the world heard about it. The, the, the health policy that is Tony Obama into, into a, 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 a head figure for the righteous in America was already in place in the old western region. It was moving speedily on. Americans are only getting onto it in the, in the 21st century. We were there in the middle of the 20th. When the World Bank opposed free education in the western region, our Lord laughed them out of court and pursued the policy and succeeded. But they have cons consistently created that class. They took a group of Nigerian social scientists away from this country, trained them in miserable World Bank economics that devalue productivity in favor, in favor of consuming, from the West, consuming what the West produces. And it has become the culture. In South Africa, it has also become the culture. We had people who genuinely fought. In Nkrumah's case, what they did to Nkrumah was a different ball game. Unlike Awolowo who could not become head of state of his country and therefore could only perform the magic in a region. 
Nkrumah had a country to play with. And what did they do to him? They went after after Nkrumah consistently and hacked him down. When Nkrumah shouted against imperialism, people always said, what is he talking about? Until Nkrumah was thrown out of power and died. And then it became obvious and clear through confessions by CIA operatives who admitted that they were the ones who created Nkrumah's problems. Actually, if Awarowop had pursued genocide, the war would not have gone the way it went. Awarowop insisted that Nigeria must remain a united country. That's what number one. And he said so from the day he left prison till the way day the war started. And he went out making every effort to ensure that all the regions came to a common table to take the decision. Unfortunately, those who did not have guns but were campaigning for war are the ones talking about genocide. No, the genocide was created by those who started war. They knew they were not prepared for. It is wrong to land your people in a mess because you refuse to make use of the practices you learned in a proper war school. One day proper soldiers, what they learned in the war colleges they refused to make use of. It, no, it wasn't genocide. It was a, 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 group, of, a group of intellectuals and military, mili, mi, military men who refused to make use of the knowledge that was available. Their failure is now being interpreted as the genocidal uh, binge of the other side. No, it is wrong to interpret the Nigerian Civil War as that. But there is one opinion that if Awula was going to prove that he truly loves Nigeria and wanted it won, he would not have encouraged blockade to these, especially no! killing children. No! Blockade against... had already happened. It was, look, blockade did not happen, blockade did not happen because Awula said so. It was the military situation that created a blockade, a blockade because the soldiers had already surrounded the eastern region. They, and the soldiers ensured that only they got the resources that were being brought in. It was the soldiers that starved the children of Biafra because they did not allow even the, the Red Cross to distribute the goods properly to those who really needed it. Worse, now that we have been reading Alabi in Sama, we all know that one of the great failings of the Biafra side was that they moved populations from where they could farm and took them to areas where they were just bloody refugees waiting, for, waiting to be fed. That was planless, planless revolt. When you don't plan your revolt and you do not think it through, things like that happen. When, when, the, when people talk of genocide in that kind of situation, for God's sake, we should also ask them wh where their brains went to. Because if you, if you say children are dying, it means you are taking a military decision. How many children would I let die in order to wait for ammunition to come? That is the issue. They were taking a military decision. They were prepared to let so many children die per day rather than allow resources to enter the, the Biafran enclave as they would want it. Don't let us ever run away from that fact. A, a, a war, once it has started, answers to military dictates and imperatives. And those who imagine that you need a Jesus Christ in the midst of all that should tell us to tell us why Jesus sometimes went to court to throw out the, the traders and the corrupt, the corrupt commercials. The, the, the point I am making therefore is this. When you hear of the word genocide, don't look at it as something that Nigeria did to Biafra. It was something that the Biafra military and intellectual class did to their own people. They had to make a choice as to how many children they were allowed to see dead in order to continue with their revolution. They prefer to see the children die. Mm. But are you, are you familiar with this quote credited to Chief Obafemi Awolowo? All is fair in war. You don't continue to supply food for your enemy to work stronger and fight against you. Is that true? That is it truly credited to Chief Obafemi Awolowo? So, if I say it wasn't credited to him, that makes the statement either right or wrong. Just listen. I have just described the situation for you. Or if you say all is not fair in, all is not fair in war, and you want to quote me the Geneva Convention, the first question I would ask you, there is a meal between you and the next army. If you grab the meal, you will eat and you can fight back. Are you going to give it to your opponent to take so that he will fight you? So that he will have the means to fight you? When they say, when they are, if you are talking about all being fair or unfair in war, you are talking about allowing your opponent to get the resources that you should use 
would you rather commit suicide so that your opponent can live? It's a very simple question. Don't answer the question anyway. If you are honest, you will agree that what Aolowo said at that time made any more sense. If we were fighting with the Republic of Benin, would we be giving them oil so that they will have the means to drive their armored cars into Nigeria? That's not how to fight a war. When you are fighting a war, you fight wars. Americans are using drones to kill all their enemies today. Are we pretending that they are doing it in pursuit of the Geneva Convention? If you want to say that all is not fair in war, and that everybody must follow the Geneva Convention, lose a war first, and then you, you answer the rest of the question. There are things you don't do in war. Actually, you have a lot of people, you can say, the federal troops protected and saved during the war. Where were the Nigerians saved by Biafra? You, it's, it's, or it has never occurred to you that we don't have prisoners of war in that sense. So don't, don't bring that in. Those who do it, they think that sentimentality is a way to win arguments. No, it is no way to win serious arguments. Because if tomorrow Nigeria is faced with a war against any other country, we will still be confronted by the same questions. Whether we want to capitulate or fight. And if you want to fight and you choose to feed your enemies in order to, to make the war civilized, that's, that's left to you.